Hi, my name is Andrew Gelman. I teach statistics and political science at Columbia University in New York. Yes, my name is uh, Christian Hennig, and I'm a statistics lecturer at University College London. Okay, and I'd like to start this interview by which we'd like to give some video introduction to our paper Beyond uh, Subjectivity and Objectivity in Statistics by asking you, uh, Andrew, what motivated you actually to work on this project and to write this paper together with me? I felt that I think philosophy is important if for no other reason than bad philosophy can make people do bad things. I felt that there were statistical methods that people were not using because they were concerned about subjectivity. And conversely, I felt that people were not always fully exploring their assumptions, um, partly using subjectivity as a sort of shield to avoid examining their models. And what about you? I Remember a few years ago, I told you I had this idea of writing a paper, and you said you wanted to participate too. So what interested you in the project? Well, there, there are basically two lines of motivation. One is the one that comes from applied statistics, so which is actually quite similar to yours. Um, so when working uh, with people and giving statistical advisory, I quite often realized that people would not want to make decisions or at least um, they would not like to uh, present decisions that they made um, as decisions so they would basically always want to say okay is there some kind of literature that says this is how things have to be done and um, can we somehow estimate from the data what we have to do here um, rather than using their own knowledge of the subject and um, using this to motivate what they do in statistics. Oh, that reminds me of a funny thing, which is that when statisticians talk about other people's work, we give them a really hard time for not making data-based decisions or not making evidence-based decisions. So we love to laugh at epidemiologists who jump to conclusions from observational studies or economists who forget about selection bias or education researchers who think that the new treatment works without comparing it to a control. But then when we decide as statisticians how to analyze our data or as professors decide what how to teach we just pull out ideas out of nowhere we don't we don't do i don't think i've ever seen someone do a randomized experiment to see whether bayesian inference is better than p values or, or whatever so we demand a level as as statisticians we demand a level of sort of justification for other people's decisions that we don't at all ex expect for our own decisions I think, I mean, when you said that, it uh, actually I thought it fits my kind of second line of motivation quite well why I was interested in this. Because um, I, I always had this philosophical interest, and for me, it was basically an interest in understanding what we do and why we do it in the way we do. And uh, I think one thing I figured out is that there is some kind of basic tension in science um, which on one side means that we we want to uh, we want to find out something that holds for all kinds of people right that has a certain um, generality um, that makes reference to a reality that is the same reality uh, for all of us but on the other hand um, it is really not possible to have a, to to have some access to this real, reality without coming from some kind of personal point of view and um, to connect this back to what you are doing uh, to what you have been saying um, that so there's always this tension um, between um, the wish to do something that we can kind of justify in a way that everybody else um, we hope would find this convincing and basically uh, beyond criticism on one hand and on the other hand um, that there, there, there's always the experience that this in an ideal way can never be done and that we always have to come from our own 
perspective and also need to justify things from our own perspective. And I think that we really um, that we really deprive ourselves of uh, some important options if we um, if we basically say no, we don't make decisions. We always use kind of uh, directions that um, that are kind of standard that everybody has to do, and uh, or that basically are estimated from the data. Well, Karl Popper talked about world three, which is this shared world of human experience, and there is this idea that like how do you get to world three and how do you get out of it? So it's like it somehow there's this, there are these shared knowledge and things that we agree upon, but, but why is that? I can tell a little story, which also maybe what really motivated me to write this paper. This was in 1991, shortly after I got my PhD, I went to the Bayesian conference in Spain and it was, um, you know, I was all excited about going and meeting all the famous Bayesians. I had done Bayesian statistics in my research, so I got to meet these people. And I would, I would go to see these talks or look at people's posters, and everybody would have a model because that's what you do when you do Bayesian statistics. And sometimes I would ask people like, if their model fit the data, had they checked the model, and person after person would say, no, we didn't check the model because it's subjective. And so, like, it seemed funny to me, like, if it's subjective, it seems like you should really have to check it, because why should I believe your subjective model? But I felt like they had a philosophy under which they were using, as I said before, they were using subjectivity as a kind of shield um, to protect themselves from any um, reflection. And that kind of bothered me, but at the same time, it, what you said that I recognize my own work is, is very subjective, I use information, and so, I had this idea of writing a paper about objectivity and subjectivity, but I think what you added to it, well, one of the things you added to it was the idea that of framing everything in a positive way. The saying, what are the good things about subjectivity, like subjectivity being awareness to multiple perspectives, for example, and objectivity having this idea of correspondence with reality and having it um, a shared, shared point of agreement. And so I thought that was very interesting that came from you, this idea that different aspects of objectivity, agreement is not the same as, compar as, as correspondence to reality. Those are two different virtues of objectivity. And the idea that we could have both sets of virtues by not putting them in opposition got me very happy. Well, one thing that I liked about the very first thing that you sent to me when you started to write the paper was that um, there was this uh, remark in what you wrote that objectivity actually can have very different meanings and um, that quite often these meanings are conflated when something is presented as objective. And this, this is something that, um, A, you can also find in the philosophical literature, right? We have an appendix uh, to the paper where this is uh, elaborated on a bit, but B, I think this, this is really one of the things that are most problematic with the concept of objectivity that people when they talk about it's not really clear what they talk about and i think this this uh, decomposition of the idea of objectivity into several different concepts like transparency consensus um by which i not don't mean that um, there has to be consensus all the time but rather that we should do our work in such a way that um, it is possible to facilitate consensus, to present arguments, to connect to what's already in the literature. So I was really interested in um, what the positive characteristics of uh, objectivity really are that we needed in science and we want to have in science. And, and, and there's really a list of them. Um, and I found very fascinating that, that, that you had the same observation that it is basically it is a big concept that refers to several things and that when it's used just um, some people would state okay what we do is objective what these other guys do is subjective that this is really not very precise and doesn't really help the understanding of what is really going on and what we really want to do there yeah it re reminds me a bit of I, my colleague even von mechelen who's a personality psychologist was telling me years ago about the so-called big five personality traits, which has kind of been 
is not really taken so seriously anymore, but are these things like introversion and extroversion and, and different traits that you can have. And he pointed out that of all of the, of the five traits, each of them had a positive direction and a negative direction, so that they were presented as merely descriptive, but you kind of rather be extroverted than introverted and, and so forth for each trait. So objectivity and subjectivity has this funny thing too that objectivity is kind of the good one and subjectivity is the bad one and then people say they're subjective and it's not it's not clear what they mean by that. Let me, let me ask you a question, maybe this can close off our, our discussion, that <laughs> our paper, so it was, it's sort of, I think, it's very natural to say philosophy is not so important. Like I started off being very defensive, saying I think philosophy is important because blah, 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 blah. So at the very least, maybe our paper makes a contribution because somewhere out there, there's someone who will now do an analysis and not be worried that they're being called subjective, something like that. But more operationally, suppose you're a reader of this paper, you're a practicing statistician or data analyst, and you already feel that you're doing fairly reasonable things. You don't feel that you're naive. Is there something that such a reader could get from our paper? Like, is there a way that this could change people's practice in some way? What do you, what do you think? I think it would be better if people made context dependent decisions more consciously. So for example, I mean, I do uh, cluster analysis and one important question in cluster analysis is how many clusters are there? Um, but uh, so, so people would tend to use some kind of automatic method to decide that, but that's problematic because uh, if you, for example, think, okay, a cluster should look like something that comes from a normal distribution and then something that looks slightly different from a normal distribution, can be modeled better by two or three normal distributions. And then um, people would say, okay, if you have a method that uh, automatically tells you there are three normal distributions here, um, people would say that's three clusters because they get that from such a formal method. But really, um, whether, uh, whether some subset of the data should be rather one or three clusters or how much separation there should be between different clusters, uh, depends on what the clusters are used for and what in the situation you want to interpret as a cluster. And I, I think people should uh, just become more conscious uh, in general about um, what decisions cannot be made from the data or from statistical theory and need to be made from the knowledge of uh, the background and need to be made from the knowledge of what the analysis then is used for. So for me, I could name something fairly specific, although I don't know if it's caused by um, us writing the paper or whether it's just something that came along the same time. But over the past few years, I've used more and more strong prior distributions. I moved from informative priors to weakly informative to priors to more strong prior information. Some of that has to do with applications that working in areas like pharmacology where you know a lot and where the data are weak and you have to make a decision. Part of it is because of, of STAN, our, our computer program, I'm able to fit more complicated models so the more complicated model you put in a strong prior to kind of keep it under control. And I think about how I justify my priors and I think my justifications now are much more explicit. So rather than saying, well, here's a prior, this is something we used in the literature and I think it has good theoretical properties. It's really like, I think it's reasonable to expect the parameter to lie in this range. So I'm, I feel like it in some ways, I'm getting some of the virtues of objectivity and subjectivity, that I'm getting the virtue of using external information which not directly in the data, which is something you get from a subjective perspective, but then I'm trying to improve communication, connection to a shared world by explaining where the numbers come from and not saying they just came from my head. I think I like, I'd like to say something kind of starting off from what you said, because um, one 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 issue with this, and this this uh, comes up very often when I um, work with people with whom I collaborate or whom I'm, I advise, is um, 
the issue how perfectionist or how perfect we can be in justifying these um, decisions. Because, I mean, there, there are some nice examples in the paper, right, where um, we, we, we make a few statements where we say, okay, the parameter could be, um, be in the following range, um, but that, of course, doesn't imply how exactly to choose the prior distribution. And I have this uh, issue where we, uh, we were thinking about uh, applying a transformation to an income distribution, and that would be log income plus some kind of constant and then the choice of the constant had quite some implications on the results of the cluster analysis that we did um, with the data and I think um, one issue here is and, and, and this can be much more openly discussed with the collaborators and, and people who apply statistics as the result of our paper is that on one hand we need to accept that we have to make these decisions and we cannot give a perfect justification. But on the other hand, um, we, this still means that we have to give some kind of justification. So we need to come up with some reasoning um, that gives us the idea and our readers uh, the idea why choosing it in a certain way um, adds something to the analysis, makes it better in terms of the aim of our analysis and things like that. Um, and we shouldn't shy away from doing that just because the background information is not so precise that we can give a precise argument um, how exactly to choose uh, these values. And I'd hope that people would be encouraged to make such decisions more and being honest about them by the paper rather than either making the decisions and basically uh, sweeping them under the carpet when presenting their results or on the other hand trying not to make such decisions and to always go for the most standard solution there. I think but, we've done enough though. I think people don't yeah. want to watch too much. They can read the paper. so. I think that's yes. fine okay. enough. 